This episode of Wheat Pete's Word is brought to you by Miravis Neo from Syngenta. You can trust Miravis Neo to protect your corn against diseases like gibberella ear rot and tar spot. Miravis Neo is the only corn fungicide solution that delivers yield and quality all in one jug. Visit syngenta.ca for more info. Good day and welcome to Wheat Pete's Word here on Real Agriculture for Wednesday, August the 7th. On this episode of The Word, it's all about speed and then safety. Don't forget safety. Learning opportunities just continue out there. Ah, the weather, man, we will touch briefly on the weather. It just, the water disparity in the province of Ontario and actually across North America continues. And after that, agronomy, agronomy, agronomy. Lots to talk about about when it comes to agronomy. Let's go! Yes, so it drives Johnson crazy that the podcast Wheat Pete's Word always seems to be too long. It's gotten up to 20, 21, 22 minutes. And I wanted it 15 or less. And Ryan Benjamins, my great friend, a super agronomist, Lambton County, says, Peter, it's quite simple. If you think it's too long, well, if anyone complains, tell them to listen to it at a faster speed. You can actually... Pick the speed you listen on all these YouTube videos. Ryan listens at 1.5 times. And you know what? That turns a 22-minute podcast into a 15-minute podcast. Perfect. My great friend, and Lindsay Smith, works with Real Agriculture. Rice the post most of the time for the word. She listens to it at 2x speed. And I'm going, Lindsay, I talk so fast. How in the world can you hear anything at 2x speed? But... There's the solution. By the way, no one has ever complained to me that Wheat Pete the Word podcast is too long. But at the end of the day, I just think it, I don't want to chew up that much of your precious time. And I wish I could get to things quicker. But the easy answer is listen to it faster. And you'll, you'll hopefully get the message and it'll be a 15 minute podcast, even though Wheat Pete will continue to talk way too long. Okay, let's move on to safety. And here's a really interesting one from Donald at Udney. Tractor, two empty gravity wagons driving down the road. The draw pin snapped. The wagons ended up in the ditch. But Donald says this is the second time they've had that draw pin snap or a draw pin snap. Obviously not the same one twice. But what strikes me is, wait a minute, Donald. The pin snapped. The wagons ended up in the ditch. Where was the safety chain? And so this, I'm coming back to this safety. I can't tell you how many times I see tractors and gravity wagons driving down the road and there are safety chains on the gravity wagons and they're wrapped around the drawbar and they're not connected to the tractor. Come on, people, safety. By the way, that safety chain also needs to be strong enough that if the draw bolt does snap and you've got loaded gravity wagons, it's got to be strong enough to keep it attached to the, the unit that's pulling it so that it doesn't end up going where it, it shouldn't. Fortunately, in Donald's situation, no one was hurt. But safety, 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 think twice, act once, and make sure you connect those safety chains. Just It's simple. Get it done. Hey, learning opportunities. You know, I brag anytime I get into an urban situation, I brag about how agriculture, farmers, we are the best people in terms of continuous education, in terms of learning new things. All the meetings that we attend, all the opportunities that we get, make sure you take those opportunities this summer. Uh, one that's coming up in Leeds County out in eastern Ontario is the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association Summer Tour. I wish I could attend. It's just a little bit too far away, but the 16th and 17th of August in conjunction with the Federation of Agriculture have a look at that. There's a really cool cover crop panel out there I wish I could listen to, just not going to make it. All right, let's move on and talk about the weather. And so what's really interesting, from Dale Cowan, we are about 200 crop heat units 
ahead of last year. And so we're ahead of normal. It's been a great year from a heat accumulation standpoint. Nature Nut Nick saying July was normal. That's really interesting to me. I, it felt like July was hot, but I, I anticipate it was the humidity as much as anything that made that feel hot. It was perfect corn growing weather, by the way. Those temperatures in, in kind of the low 30s, high 20s, low 30s in the daytime, 20, 23 at night, the corn has just been rocking. And yet despite that, early or additional heat and July being excellent, the corn crop does not look like it's ahead of normal. It's sort of depending on area and when it got planted. And there's the key, planting date. So we calculate crop heat units based on a May 1st start. Most of the corn this year did not, not get planted till about May the 20th. And some of the corn did not get planted till June the 15th. So from a tassel timing, I think a lot of the crop is about normal. It was late July. The later planted corn is tasseling even now or not quite yet. So the corn crop is, is not ahead of normal. The soybean crop is in a similar situation. Nature Nut Nick saying that his soybeans are well behind where they were a year ago. Of course, a year ago, he planted in May. This year, he planted June 15th. So that it's all about planting date. Fortunately, for those planting late, so far, we've had a good year to help them get through to maturity. And, and let's hope that that continues right through until end of September or at least middle of October, somewhere in that range. On the rainfall front, just continue to get this situation where a, probably north of Highway 8... There's a lot of people saying we need more rain. When we get down into the London region, there's a lot of people saying, please, no more rain. It happened again on Tuesday. The Glencore area, 1.6 inches of rain. On holiday Monday, down around Port Stanley, they just got inundated with heavy thunderstorms, hail, lots of issues down there. Meanwhile, once we get up into Wellington County and Bruce County, they're saying, please, we only got two tenths of an inch. We're, we're just borderline. We need more rainfall. It's one of those years where it's there's no equity. You look into Ohio, I find it really interesting. 86% of Ohio is abnormally dry. The only area that is normal is right up against Ontario, kind of in that, that western, northwestern corner of Ohio, up against the southwestern part of Ontario. You go out to Saskatchewan, and Mark saying he's got cracks in the ground three inches wide. Again, even in western Canada, there are wet areas, there are dry areas. Rainfall is just all over the map. And... Meanwhile, Donald at Udney reporting that in that particular area, so that's up in Simcoe County area, man, they are just about perfect. Donald saying that the corn there, 34,000 plants per acre, 18 rows around, 45 long, it couldn't be much better. So that's awesome, Donald. So it's just the way it works in Ontario. We get people, we get the haves and the haves nots. The one note from Barry, Barry sent me some rain data. He said, you know, it's still just crazy in this Brantford area. We've had way too much water on heavy clay soils. But his point, and I think it's really interesting, he went back into the 80s. He said, we've had other years. 1986 was one, I think, 1992. Those years we actually had as much rain as we've had this year. The real difference is if you got the crop planted, and in some areas they didn't get the crop planted, but if you got the pl crop planted, today's hybrids and soybean varieties, corn hybrids, soybean varieties, have much better stress tolerance than the, we used to have back in the 80s. So those crops, despite the bounding they're taking, are probably looking better than what we should expect them to look. The one thing I will say, though, because the yield tours are going to start pretty soon, in this part of the world, from the scouting that I have done, and this is being repeated by a number of agronomists, 
If you recall, one of the things about the corn crop that helps determine the final yield is the number of cobs per acre and the number of plants that actually make it through to, to silk and pollinate and have kernels. Uh, that number appears to be a bit lower this year. Last year, I think the average number was pushing 32,000 cobs per acre. Other years, we've been kind of 30 or 29.5. This year, it sort of looks like we're back into that 29,000, 29,500 in a lot of the fields just in the wetter areas. The, there just has been more plant death because of those adverse conditions. One last note before we get into agronomy, Robert called me from Glencoe. He said, Peter, we planted wheat. And by the way, the soybean crop, I mentioned Nature Nut Nick, we're way behind. Trying to get wheat planted after soybeans this year looks like it's going to be a big challenge in some areas for sure if you planted those soybeans on the 15th of June. Man, that just gets terrible. Uh, Robert saying last, last fall was incredibly wet. They did not get their wheat planted until November the 15th to November the 20th. And all year they thought it was a bust because... All winter long, they could barely see any green at all. In the spring, it took forever to green up. They were questioning if they should even put nitrogen on the wheat crop. They decided to go ahead and do that. And that wheat planted late turned out between 80 and 95 bushels per acre. The earlier wheat in that area is kind of 95 to 100 bushels per acre. They are astounded that they could get that close to earlier planted wheat. And at the end of the day, Robert just said, wow, don't give up on the wheat crop. And thankfully, they managed to plant those wheat acres because this spring in that Glencoe area, they have a bunch of wheat, or a bunch of acres rather, that are unplanted. And so his one question was, how early can we plant wheat in the Glencoe area on these unseeded acres? And that answer is pretty simple. Man, look at the Go Crops website under the cereal section, get your ideal planting date and stay within a week or 10 days of that ideal planting date if you can. At Glencoe, that's about October the 1st, but man, on those unseeded acres, if you look at the weather and another hurricane is headed this way, it's fit to plant on September the 10th or September the 5th and it looks like it's going to get too wet and you might not get get it planted till November the 20th, cut your seeding rate back and plant the wheat. I just, on heavy clay soils, you can't take the risk. On sandy or loamier soils, you can take that risk. You might well take less yield by planting too early, particularly if you don't manage seeding rates. You're gonna plant ultra early, plant 800,000 seeds per acre, not two million seeds per acre. But if you get a really warm fall, you'll get fall disease. We just can't seem to do much about that. But you'll take a 5 or a 10 bushel yield hit versus if it starts raining and you end up planting like Robert in mid-late November, man, oftentimes that's a 30 bushel yield hit. The risk of low yield by planting too early is far less than the risk of low yield by planting too late when it comes to winter wheat. So if you have to plant early, you manage that risk with seeding rate, get it in the ground. On the other hand, I did have a question about winter barley seeding date. Winter barley seeding date is 10 days, 10 to 14 days ahead of the optimum date for winter wheat. So again, go to Go Crops, look at your area, your optimum date for, for winter wheat. You can back that up 10 days. That's the winter barley date. Winter canola is even earlier. With winter canola, we often want to get it in the last few days of August, the first few days of September. And, and that seems to be a little less driven by area of the province, although it's still driven by your area. Uh, if you're in Essex, kind of probably that first 10 days of September is ideal as we move north, probably the last few days of August, if you can get the winter canola planted, that's the optimum date. All right, let's move on. And so some cool stuff that I have learned as I've listened to different things. I read a nice article from the Ohio State University and they're finding 
some spider mites, again, Ohio's dry, spider mites are a dry thing. If you are dry in Saskatchewan, if you are dry in Ohio, if you are dry in Bruce County, then pay attention to spider mites. They start at the edges of the field. But the trick here that I did not know, we've always said when scouting numbers, you take a sheet of paper, we've always said white paper, you shake the soybean leaves over top of that white paper, you look for movement. In that article, they said that black paper works much better than white paper. So if you're scouting for spider mites, take black paper and let's do the best job we can. Control of spider mites, of course, is getting to be really problematic because many of the spider mites are now resistant to dimethoate. You, and we don't really have many other good products to use. So it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, they do have other products in the US. But regardless, spider mites, to have a look. And black paper, that's a cool scouting tip. The other one, fall armyworm. So, Last year, we saw some outbreaks of fall armyworm. We typically have not considered fall armyworm to be a pest in Ontario. They haven't in Ohio either, but they are already starting to catch some fall armyworm moths. And last year, in some alfalfa fields, in some early planted winter cereal fields, some oat fields that were looking for forage as well, so cover crop oats following wheat, Fall armyworm decimated them. So the armyworm moths, the fall armyworm moths are going to start coming in soon. We'll keep an eye on them, but just pay attention. It's one of those things that, that if, it, if we continue to get warmer and we continue to have warmer winters, fall armyworm is going to become more of a problem. Hey, one last quick note out of that article. Uh, we did talk last week about corn leaf aphids. The comment in that article was that do not... Do not spray corn, leaf, corn aphids in field corn regardless of the population. There will be no economic response because the price of corn is just too low. And I'm just going, oh man, we all know that we all know the prices are in the sewer. We're not very happy about that, but that speaks volumes if no amount of corn leaf aphids is enough to actually get out there and control them. Okay, I want to move on and and like, this is driving me nuts. Hey, what is going on? As I drive around the countryside, I cannot believe the number of winter wheat fields that have weeds going to seed in them. And so, for goodness sakes, Cohen, send your dad out with the mower or do something in those killed out spots. Those weeds are setting seed. Those seeds, weed seeds are going to be problematic for years to come. The foxtail in fields that have foxtail pressure, already there are seed heads that look like they have mature seeds. The wheat harvest was early. The wheat matured early, and so that means that those weeds are setting seed more quickly than they normally would. Get out there and do something. Burn them down. I don't care, but for goodness sakes, get those weeds and the wheat stubble under control. We know that one year's seeding is seven years weeding. Well, that's the old wives' tale anyway, but we know it makes a difference. Clip those weeds, control those weeds, stop them from going to seed in your wheat stubble. Hey, fertility, I want to talk quickly here about fertility because, man, I, and Nature Nut Nick sent me this. He said, Peter, I'm finally going to put manure back on my home farm. Haven't put manure on the home farm for years, but we've been tracking our soil tests and they finally pulled back to the point where I can use some manure on my home farm after the wheat crop. For goodness sakes, get out there and soil sample. By the way, there's also been many growers who have said third cut alfalfa is yielding almost as much as first cut alfalfa generally does. This is three massive yields of hay coming off of those acres. Well, guess what? Every ton of alfalfa that you remove from that field, every dry ton is 12 pounds of phosphorus and 50 pounds of potash. So if manure is not going back on, and even if manure is going back on, it often isn't enough. Pay attention to the amount of fertility you are putting on that alfalfa crop. Remember that fall potash to help with winter survival is a really key component of keeping good alfalfa. 
50 pounds of potash per ton. And if you've had three excellent cuts, you're probably at least, at least six ton per acre of alfalfa. Six fifties is 300 pounds of potash. And that's actual potash. That's not product. So it, it's going to take some big, big applications to keep to keep those soil test levels. I ran through the quick numbers. If you're like wheat peat and you're a corn, soybean, wheat rotation and I sell my straw, my corn yields are 220-ish, my soybean yields are 60-ish, my wheat yields this year 120-ish, straw yields through the roof. Like many producers, when I do the math on removal at those yield levels and yield makes the difference, I'm at about 210 pounds of phosphorus and 210 pounds of potash that's actual removed over the three years. And then you have to step back and say, what did I apply in my two by two band ahead of my corn? Did I do anything to the soybeans? My 100 pounds of map with my winter wheat seed and step back and say, man, I need to broadcast a lot of fertility after the wheat crop to make up for what I've removed, assuming that my soil test is in that moderate level. If you're high, you can be like nature nut neck, let it pull back. If you're low, you need to build, but do the soil test, do those calculations, get it figured out. Two last quick notes. Kevin saying, what about red clover now? I have five acres that we, we'd have to pick the rocks on. If I seed red clover now, early August, will I get a nitrogen credit? The answer is if you get an open fall, you get good red clover growth, yes, Kevin. If we get a poor fall, no red clover growth, no. So it, it, it depends. I hate saying that, but it depends. Alan asking about wood sorrel and wood sorrel control. You know, we brought wood sorrel into the province as a, a forage legume. And it's not very competitive. So any of the hormone sprays will take it out, Alan, but it's, I'm not real concerned about it just because it's not a very competitive species. Nonetheless, might as well control it if you can. And with that, that's it, that's all. On behalf of the team here at Real Agriculture, this is Wheat Pete with the word for Wednesday, August the 7th. Keep the feedback coming. Listen to me faster so that the podcast isn't as long and I'll just keep talking. See you next week.